Welcome to this video, we're focusing on the UK. There's just been a press conference from Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer, and Sir Patrick Vallance, the Chief Scientific Officer. But the principles we're going to talk about in this video, and I'm going to try and bring in a few more deductions and things that we can make from what they've been saying, are going to apply everywhere. So wherever you are, this applies to you because this pandemic is not going anywhere for the next six months. We are going to have this with us over this winter. No two ways about that. Now, going down to the details straight away, nice to see the scientist and the doctor, uh, Chris Witt is the doctor, Patrick Balance is the science, allowed out on their own, no politicians, which was nice. Chris Witt is saying we've turned a corner relatively recently, um, but not in a good way. We've turned a corner for the, for the worst. They are concerned at the moment, and if they're concerned, we need to be concerned as well. Um, full press conference available here, government slides available here, transcript uh, available there. Uh, when I came on air just now, uh, the transcript wasn't uh, wasn't printed yet, so someone will be frantically typing up as as we speak. Now, this is so important. I always put these in because these are the references. This shows I'm not making all this up. You know, you get so many people doing lessons on media and mainstream media, social media, saying all sorts of stuff, but they don't back it up with any evidence. You know, don't believe what I say unless there's some evidence to go with it. And that's the evidence. Check it all out for yourself. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll accurately relate what is there. Now, um, uh, pa Patrick Valance kicked off. He started off confirming that this is infection is spread by droplets, aerosols and surface contacts. Now, that sounds fairly obvious now, but I remember the World Health Organization umming and ahhing about this for months when it was obvious to me, certainly, that it was an aerosolized virus. The World Health Organization was saying it wasn't. Anyway, we've got rid of that initial debate now. Pity it took a few months, but we are there. This is how that virus is spread. That is why we have hands, face, space. Hand hygiene, mask on your face, respiratory hygiene, space between you and other people. Really very, very simple. But quite hard to do, perhaps. So Patrick Vallance says we need to limit the number of our contacts. You see, this virus, you know, a good way to look at viruses, people are always asking me, are viruses dead or alive? And the answer is both. I believe outside of a living cell, they're dead. They're just chemicals. But when they get into a living cell, they come alive and they reproduce and they use energy from the cell. Um, they're only alive inside the cell. So they can only reproduce inside living cells. And in this case, virtually always only human cells. So if we can stop the virus going from person to person, then this pandemic's finished. It's all about interpersonal transfer. So that's a good way to think about viruses. They're dead when they're outside the body, but when they're in a cell, then alas, they are alive and can reproduce and reproduce at a phenomenally rapid rate, unfortunately. So we need to limit our contacts. Reduce contacts in close spaces, crowds, and I was pleased to see he's talking about poor ventilation. Now, this is still not being done. Now, I know you're sick of me going on and on about it, but I'm fed up of going into shops, into a pharmacist, whatever, and, and, and the doors are all shut. You know, ventilation, this is not hard stuff. Get ventilated. And we had all those nice sayings about it a, a week or two ago, but it's still not being done. Anyway, so they reiterate that. Reduce contact with infected people, of course, which means people who are infected who need isolated all things we have looked at um, extensively. But always good to uh, just reiterate it a bit and see what's going on. Now, they went on to talk about Spain. Um, in Spain and France, the cases started increasing in younger people. So there was a lot, some in infection spreading in younger people through summer. That's now moved on to older people as well. And of course, that led to increasing cases in younger people. That didn't really, really lead to increasing hospitalizations. But now it's in older people. We've got more hospitalizations. And already in France and Spain, the death rate is starting to increase. And uh, he did show this graphic, which is very useful to look at, I think. So 
So what we're seeing here is this is the increase in cases in Spain and in France. July, August, September. And we see a lag, but now we are st starting to see increases in deaths in France and increases in deaths in Spain. And this is the lag we are well used to seeing. But what uh, the Chief Scientific Officer is saying here is he doesn't want the UK to follow in the footsteps of France and Spain in regards to these uh, increasing numbers that we are unfortunately seeing in these countries now leading through into uh, increased deaths. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Surely this virus is less virulent than it used to be. Surely less people are now dying. Well, actually, the answer to that appears to be no. Less people have died over the summer because most of infection has been in, uh, in younger people. Thankfully, they die at a massively lower rate. They can still die, but at a massively lower rate. So just to be absolutely clear about it, uh, the scientific officer is saying viral genetics have changed, but still causes disease and deaths. So what he's basically saying here is the ability of this virus to make you sick and to kill you is just the same as it's ever been. There is no fundamental change in the nature of the virus. Yes, there's been some genetic changes, but its pathogenicity and its virulence remains the same, unfortunately. Uh, in the UK, increasing cases in all age groups. And they showed this graphic, which I think was useful. Um, so, for example, here we see that most increases here have been in the 20 to 29 year old age group. So this is the age group where the cases have been most dramatically increasing. And of course, because the cases have been increasing dramatically in younger people, so far we haven't been seeing the increase in deaths, which of course is good. But all these nice colours on here, and you can download these for yourself if you want. I've given you the link. All these uh, colours on here um, are different age groups. So that light blue there, for example, is the 30 to 39 year old uh, age group. And that orange one is the 10 to 19 and the green is the 40 to 49. So while young people are leading the way and have spread a lot of the infection around to us older people, we can see from this graphic that infections are increasing in all age groups. That was the point he was making there. Uh, now, of course, we know we get more positive cases if we get more testing. So is the reason we're getting more cases diagnosed now simply because we're testing more? No, no, it's not. It's not because the number of the percentage of testing coming back positive is increasing, indicating there's more community spread. So we can't just dismiss this by saying, oh, we've got way more testing now. Yes, we have. And we've done other videos looking at why this is important. But this is a genuine increase. This increase we are seeing is not an artifact of increased testing. It's a genuine increase. Office for National Statistics data, proportion of positive tests increasing, as we've just said. 6,000 new cases a day, 70,000 people currently have the infection in the UK, but this select data is about a week to 10 days old now. Office for National Statistics data always is. It's always a bit behind the times. Um, so real cases are actually higher now. But um, it's good that they've got now the number of new cases and the number of people infected at any one time, which is currently 70,000 as of a week, 10 days ago. If we look at the COVID symptom tracker app data, we actually see that today there was 10,391 new cases up in just a 10 day period from this estimate from the Office for National Statistics. And the COVID symptom tracker app is now saying getting on for 100,000 people currently have the infection in the UK. And of course, as we always say, the COVID symptom tracker app underestimates the number of people that are actually infected because it doesn't account for asymptomatics because by definition it's looking at people that are symptomatic. This means a doubling every seven days, which is rapid. Now, that means that by mid-October, we could have 50,000 cases. And here we see the graphic that was used for this. Now, uh, Patrick Valance was at extreme pains to point out this is not a prediction. 
right? So this is not a prediction. It's what could happen. It's not a prediction. It's showing what could happen with cases doubling every seven days. So this could certainly happen, but we're really hoping it won't. But let's look at it anyway. So here we see um, where we are now. So that's 31st of um, August. Here we are in September now. Uh, that's uh, mid-October there. This constant doubling every seven days, this exponential increase is what we could have. And of course, the week after that, uh, that could theoretically be 100,000 cases a day. So we've got this great uh, potential increase. That is what could happen. That's what could happen. Um, so cases could be 50,000 a day, plus 50,000 cases a day by mid-October. One month later, that would transpose into 200 deaths per day. So by mid-November, if we don't take any action, there's going to be about 200 deaths per day. And what the politicians need now to decide is, what do we do to avoid 200 deaths per day? What, what merits this? Most of the deaths are going to be in older people. Some of the deaths are going to be in those with comorbidities. A few of the deaths are going to be in younger people. How much does this matter to a country? And uh, I've been looking at some other countries, but that's not for now. Anyway, um, so now Sir Patrick says we need speed action and we need enough action is what we need now. Now, current immunity is is no more than eight percent according to this uh, data that is showing here so this is another interesting graphic uh, these are different studies and these are the levels of antibodies that they found 6.2 Austin national statistics react to survey biobank blood transfusion services have found these levels of antibodies but of course antibodies don't last for long and not everyone zero converts so the real rate, so here we've got rates of, uh, what have we got? We've got rates of like uh, 6.2, 6, uh, 7.1, 5.5% of the population is what we've got from those uh, figures there. But these are going to be absolute minimum figures because not everyone zero converts. The antibodies don't last that long. So the number of people that have actually been exposed is going to be higher than that. Nevertheless, the chief scientific officer believes it's only about 8%. No more than 8% show antibodies. But we do know that more than that are going to be immune. The antibodies in London are 17%, which is encouraging. Anyway, that 8% relates to about 3 million people who've had the infection. Um, so most people, his point is most people are not protected by um, previous exposure to this disease so even though th these figures so but what I'm trying to say here that, that what I'm trying to say is the number of people that have actually been infected is well over eight percent in my view it could be it could be four or five percent higher than that could be 10 to 15 percent we really don't know because the antibodies don't last long it's definitely going to be higher than these antibody surveys are showing so these are minimum values but I agree completely with Sir Patrick Vallance, who says that most people are not protected. So we could argue whether this is 8% or 15%. In a sense, it doesn't make too much difference because it's not enough to get herd immunity. So most people are not protected. Most people can still be infected by this virus. Having looked at that, having said that, we, we have seen quite a bit of cross immunity. So again, these are the most pessimistic scenarios, really. Um, but it still remains true that the vast majority of the population of the UK have no immunity to SARS coronavirus 2 and could still get it. That point is completely valid. Um, geographical spread varies, but essentially all over the country, all over the UK, as well as England and Wales. The clusters have been getting bigger, increasing everywhere. And again, they had a graphic to demonstrate that. Yep, we see it here. So the, the, basically the darker colours are more cases. So you can go onto the government websites and browse your own area. Now this doesn't contain Scotland, 
but cases are increasing in Scotland as well. So while we do see regional variations, the blue there for example are where things aren't changing, the darker are where the greatest changes are, we do see that it's pretty well over all the country. So the point they're making is this is this is a problem for everyone. You can't say, oh, well, my part of the country is OK. I'm just going to carry on on my own sweet way. Everyone needs to be taking the universal precautions. It was his message. And I agree completely. That makes perfect sense. Basically, cases are increasing everywhere. It's just that some places they're increasing more than others. Um, now, hospitalizations and inpatients. Doubling time, seven or eight days. So likewise, more patients are coming to hospital. Hospital admissions are doubling every seven or eight days. Now, we did look at this yesterday. They're still relatively low, but if they keep on doubling, they're going to be pretty high pretty soon. Nowhere near where they were in uh, March, April, May. Same for Spain, same for France. Nowhere near where they were, but still uh, increasing. Potentially doubling every seven or eight days. So... You can see why they're worried. We're at the start of what could be a very steep curve. And of course, they could double again, double again, double again, this exponential growth. Seasons are against us for respiratory viruses. We are coming into um, autumn where respiratory viruses spread more. People are closed in, aren't exposed to the sun, don't make the vitamin D. More prone to respiratory viruses, unfortunately. There I am. Um, now, um, basically, this is saying this is going to be a problem for the next six months, but it's everyone's problem. It is for six months. Now, my view is that this virus is going to go away and the next six months are going to be the worst. I don't think the virus will go away in a season or two. It might take a couple of seasons to go away, but I still believe it's going to go away. But this next six months is going to be a difficult time uh, With for uh, about that. There is no doubt, unfortunately. Um, no evidence the virus is milder than in April so the virus still causes disease just the same I am afraid just as transmissible mortality will be similar to what we have seen slightly lower because the treatments are slightly better now but we still have no magic bullet treatment we still don't go to the doctor and say oh, I've got coronavirus I don't say we'll oh, take those pills that'll go away mate no unfortunately not we're just getting better at some of the in-hospital treatments now, what would high numbers uh, mean? Have I got another slide? Oh, yeah, there was a slide there. Just a minute, let me show you that. Um, there we go. Now, these are estimated new COVID-19 inpatient cases in hospital. So, as of now, we can see that the number of COVID patients is rising, with the daily admissions quite a lot higher. Now, this is OK. The health service can easily cope, well, certainly cope with these numbers. But of course, if they start doubling, then that becomes a problem. So it's kind of a warning of what could come about. Right. Um, which screen am I at? Yep, that's right. High numbers would mean... What's the problem? Why, why are we worried about this? Well, more people will die from COVID-19. NHS could be overwhelmed. Other pathologies not being treated, diagnosed early. And when I say other pathologies, what I mean by other pathologies is people who are sick, people who are in pain, people who are distressed, would find treatment more difficult to get. That's what it means. That's why we're concerned. Uh, health, uh, health effects of restrictions are a problem. So mental health issues and all the knock-on effects of the restrictions. People can't earn their normal living, can't go to work, the economic effects, the ill health that can be associated with that. High numbers can result in all of these things being a problem, unfortunately. Um, if I increase my risk, I increase the risk to others. So I have had this quite a bit 
you know well if i want to take the risk that's my problem well that, that, that's true if i go hang gliding on a mountainside with no people below to fall on but if i go hang gliding over a built-up area where there's lots of people below if i fall out of the sky i'm going to hurt other people and we're in that situation here so me taking risks means i could infect someone who infects someone who infects someone who dies you know we could be infecting those in our own households for example by us taking silly risks as individuals so it's very much a collective activity was the point that they are trying to make so um what to do reduce individual risks hands face space of course isolate of course if necessary testing positive symptomatic break unnecessary links between households so obviously we know we live in households most people live with other people not everyone of course some people are in households on their own but we need to break the links between other households and they've mostly occurred at work and in social situations works a bit tricky social life might need to be put on hold a bit at the moment and then science is going to help science means improved testing science means improved medical treatments science means vaccination as well so that was the final point about the talk and we'll make it our final point for today as well uh, the importance of vaccination now what the uk has done is basically they put dabs on all of these vaccines so if any of these come good um, the uk has got access to these vaccines so we've kind of backed we've backed five horses in this race if any one of them come in then we, we can we can uh, we can have mass vaccination um so the situation with vaccination 240 vaccine uh, candidates globally 14 clinical trials nine in large scale clinical trials and to alleviate our guilt at putting dabs on all these uh all these vaccines um that we basically put pre-orders on in uh, we do note here, which I am pleased to see, UK is also committed to joining COVAX, an international initiative supporting discovery, manufacture and fair distribution of COVID-19 vaccines worldwide. But if any of these come good, um, the UK can get them straight away. And other rich countries have done the same. The United States has done exactly the same. It's backed about half a dozen vaccine horses as well. Any of them come good then many people will be vaccinated but it's going to be mostly in 2021 a few people could be vaccinated in 2020 but for vast majority of us vaccine is not going to come till 2021 so that's where we are at at the moment in the uh, in the uk i think what i'll do is i'll just go back to what i think is the most profound slide that one indicating what could happen without appropriate action now we don't want to have massive shutdowns and this is true anywhere so we all have to follow the precautions that we all know about now and we all have to take part for the next six months after that science will probably come to rescue us i do believe it will especially in the vaccines i'm not too optimistic about therapeutics um, some might come good, um, but I'm not too optimistic there'll be any cheap ones readily available uh, anytime soon. Uh, but the vaccine certainly will. But that we've got one more winter to get through. And that means that we have to all pull together with all of these basic things. The hand hygiene, the face masks, the respiratory hygiene, the avoiding crowded areas, the maintaining physical distancing. Well, you know all this. I'm not going to keep going over it but uh, there's one thing knowing it and of course there's something else doing it so we need to walk the walk as well as talk the talk thank you for watching as uh, as always <laughs>